What's going on, everyone? Two days in a row, commute video. Why the hell not, right? And the only reason that I'm doing this video is because someone actually commented, can you talk about options? So, I can do that. that that's, that's easy. Very, very bumpy roads, and it's raining, and it's dark. Yay. So, so anyway, on today's video, on today's commute podcast, by the way, this is a podcast. It is saved under the podcast category, but it is a video, but I guess it is considered a podcast. I'm not sure what YouTube does with the podcast if they put them in other libraries or other locations for you to listen. If anyone knows that, actually, if you don't mind letting me know, because I know someone told me that I should look into, you know, posting this in other places as a podcast, but I thought it, I thought that was the case. God, my defroster suck. But, but anyway, so let's talk about options, right? I may have to crack a window here, so it's noisy. I apologize. Um, so people that listen to my channel, more than likely you are either into options or of course, more than likely into yield max, high, high income, covered call ETFs, you know, stuff like that. Now, if you just invest in those ETFs and you're wondering like how they're able to produce an income, you know, it's simple. The answer is options. And then if you're wondering, should you learn options? Um, I think the answer is yes. It doesn't mean you should trade options because not many people have time to do that because it, you know, it involves a lot of time, a lot of research, a lot of patience, and a lot of money. Um, so it is much easier to invest in yield max, rec shares, defiance, and let them do the work and we pay the fee much easier so however that doesn't mean that you should not take the time to try to learn about options right so where do you even begin well I mean basically you begin on YouTube between YouTube books I don't know if you guys hear the shitty roads in New Jersey but it's horrible um books, YouTube, and then trial and error. That's basically, in my opinion, the best ways to learn. Now, when I say YouTube, I'm not just talking about me, obviously. I'm talking about all the various YouTubers because some people explain things better for certain people. Um, I know, like for me, for example, I could listen to you know, YouTubers on certain things, but not on other things. And then there's certain YouTubers I just can't even listen to um, because I just don't like either their tone, like their sarcastic attitude, or maybe they even, they use words that, you know, I don't even understand or, you know, or they're just too damn slow or, you know, it, it depends. Everyone needs someone at their own level, you know, to learn options. So I'll do my best to explain the basics of options and then my option strategy, you know, at the end. Um, but yeah, the basics of options, and I'm, again, I'm not going to get too advanced because I'm not advanced, to be honest. I don't, I never really learned anything beyond the basics and I don't want to uh, because I'm not going to use it, you know, I, I, I don't have the time. When I do have the time, that's a different story. Like when I'm retired, if I want to capitalize on the different things, completely different story. But anyway, so think of four different things, four sections, right? Think of like a cube. There's four different little squares in that cube. There's a buy call, there's a buy put, there's a sell call, there's a sell put. And that's it. Just think of those four different options and understand what each of them does and once you can do that I think you'll be just fine 
So what the heck is a buy call? What the heck is a buy put, right? So we'll start with the buys. When you buy a put, when you buy a call, you're spending money. So it's you on the other side that's spending the money um, and, you know, for a specific reason. So why would you buy a put? Well, you'd buy a put because, you know, you want to, it's, it's a more of like a downside protection, right? You're betting on the stock going down. So I know, you know, for example, if people own a lot of shares of a certain stock, they want, they may want to buy puts for downside protection because, you know, if they buy a put at a certain price, then it allows them to sell their shares at that certain price should it tank. So they could sell it at a higher price if it goes down below that. So that's the protection that they're buying, right? They're buy a put, they're, they're paying a premium to a seller who's committing to buying their shares at that price, right? So again, when you buy the put, you're the one paying someone for your protection. Me personally, I don't buy puts. And then there's buy calls. When you buy a call, you're betting on the stock to go up. And the beauty of buying calls is if they always say, like, if you can't afford shares of something, you can trade it through buying calls. So if you think, you know, an expensive stock like MSTR, for example, is going to go up and, you know, you don't have 10 G's, then you're going to buy a call and you're going to pay a premium and you're going to bet that the stock is going to go above, you know, a certain price. And if it does, guess what? You can make money on that buy call. However, when you buy the call, you're shelling out money. So you're betting via purchasing, right? You're purchasing. Instead of purchasing the stocks, you're, you're paying a premium, you know, to someone, someone else on the other side of it, uh, the seller. And you're saying, all right, I'm, you know, I want the right, but not the obligation to purchase these shares at this price. So if the stock does go above that certain price, you know, by that expiration date, you can cash out or you can buy the shares at that what you consider the discount. But if it doesn't go up, then you just lose your money, right? In both examples, if it doesn't go your way as the buyer, all you have, the worst case scenario is you lose that money, all right? Now, the other side of the house, which is the selling, sell put, sell call, that's what I do. And the reason I do that side of the house is because I'm an income investor, right? I invest for income. That is the whole point for me of investing. That is why I got involved with investing, because I want more income. I don't want to work for income all the time, right? I want other sources to produce me some income. Now, selling options is a way to do that. So when you think of selling a put, um, you know, when you sell a put, what you're doing is you're committing to buying a stock at a certain price at a, by a certain date, right? So just like we said, the buyer of the put is getting the protection, right? They're, they're basically saying, I want to be able to sell this stock to you at a certain price by a certain date. And you're saying, okay, I'll gladly accept that risk and responsibility, but I'm taking your premium. So you sell a put, you commit to buying those shares at whatever strike, whatever expiration date, but you're collecting the premium, right? So, you know, and why would you do that? Why would you do that? Well. Why the hell not, right? If, if you believe in the stock or the ETF that you're selling the put on, instead of just buying 100 shares outright, you would sell a put for one contract, one, each contract is 100 shares, and you'd say, okay, I'll buy it at this price, I like this price, and I'll buy it by this date, and, but you gotta pay me some money to do that, all right? So guess what? If you sell a put on a stock for a strike price of 10 bucks, right? You know, again, it's 100 contracts, so, I mean 100 shares per contract, so 100, con 100 shares for 
for ten dollars is um, you know a thousand bucks so you have to have one thousand dollars so you're like okay I'll put up a thousand bucks and I'll commit to buying these shares at ten bucks a piece by this date and you gotta pay me you know X amount of premium and guess what if the stock goes up above that strike price by the expiration date you don't have to buy those shares that contract expires worthless you get your thousand dollars back and you still collect the premium you know and some consider you know it could be considered worst case or best case but we'll just say worst case scenario is the stock goes below your ten dollar strike price it goes like say to nine dollars um, by expiration date and you still have to buy these shares at ten dollars a piece so your thousand dollars that you posted that's gone right that went to the buyer because they want that now they want to sell their shares um, at ten dollars a piece so because the, the stocks at nine so of course they want to sell it at ten dollars a piece so you get even though the stocks at nine you got to buy it at ten uh, because you agreed to that all right you agreed to that so and that's you know that's your risk that's the side of it so what about selling a call what is selling a call well it's basically you know everything is the opposite of one another right so let's just say you got to sign those shares ten dollars a piece ten dollar strike um, again we said it was nine bucks at the time but what if it recovers and goes back up to ten dollars well, guess what? You'll be able to sell calls on that with a $10 strike and get get premium, right? Think of it as, you know, again, again 100 share blocks, each, con each one contract is 100 shares. So think of it, you know, those as, as blocks, essentially. So think of it, you're, you always get paid now for buying or selling shares. So you got paid for buying the shares, now you're not just gonna sell the shares just hit sell you're gonna sell a call you're gonna sell a call like listen I'll sell these shares back for ten dollars a pop but I want to get paid I want to get paid again I want to get premium so you're gonna get paid a premium from the buyer and you're committing to selling your shares at ten dollars by a certain date all right and the beauty of that is you don't lose a dime capital right all you do is you collected the premium on the sell put and now you're collecting the premium on the sell call so essentially that thousand dollars that you put up and you had to use you know that's in and out right that's a wash that's just a tool for you to make money in between and that essentially is the wheel strategy that they call it right they sell puts and then they sell calls and they sell puts and then they sell calls but if you sell a put and you don't get assigned and guess what happens? You can, you know, you sell another put. And then if you don't get assigned again, you sell another put and sell another put. And then uh, once you do get assigned, you use those shares and you sell calls. But of course, like if you sell a call at $10 strike, you get assigned, the stock is at nine, it doesn't recover, it goes down to eight. You know, that scenario sucks, right? Because you don't want to sell a call at eight dollars then because your cost basis is ten you typically want to sell the calls at or above your cost basis so you don't lose out on capital because or else what's the point yes you're collecting premium but if you're losing out you know that same amount or more on capital then there's really no point you have to think of the total profit now this is leading me into my strategy now I trade options currently on TSLL. So first off, let's talk about who and why you would trade options on, you know. So, so first off, like, to me, it has to be cheap because I'm a broke ass um, and it has to be volatile. So TSLL is a 2X leverage fund of Tesla, so it moves double Whatever Tesla does, it moves twice. You know, it does. So if Tesla goes up 5%, TSLL goes up 10%. And a day like today, Tesla is look, looking like it's going down a lot, right? So it looks like pre market, last time I checked, 
it was down 7%, Tesla was. So TSLL is down 14%. So that's, you know, the double leverage piece, right? Also, the other part that's double is the implied volatility. So Tesla typically has an implied volatility around the 40 to 50% range. And this, this also doubles for TSLL. TSLL has implied volatility around, um, you know, the uh, 80 to 100, sometimes over 100% implied volatility. Now, anything with that type of implied volatility, that can produce some serious premium and, you know, make some good bang for your buck. Yeah, these, these defrosters, man, are worst. All right, so, um, what the heck was I saying? All right, so, so number one, yes, you have to find a stock that you'd be willing to own. Like, if you're going to do the strategy that I'm doing, which is, you know, it's a wheel strategy, essentially, um, you have to be okay with owning the stock, okay? Now, the difference that I do <clears throat> that most people don't is I don't really trade it unless I can afford it 10 times over. When I say 10 times over, I'm talking about 10 contracts. So 10 contracts means 1,000 shares of that particular stock. So take whatever the price of your stock is, multiply it by 1,000, and ask yourself, do you have that type of capital? Okay? If you don't, in my like. If I don't, I'm not trading it. So, you know, for example, like a, a stock like TNA, it's a triple leverage fund of low cap stocks. You know, TNA is around what, 50 bucks? I forget what it's at. But I don't have, you know, $50,000 to trade options on TNA. I don't. TSLL, it's around the $10 range. Right now, it's around like 11. So, you know, $11, a thousand, sh uh, yeah, a thousand shares, that's $11,000. That I do have. That I can shell out. Look at this guy, that's bright. That, you know, is what I can shell out in order to play options with. I can afford that. So even though I'm starting out, you know, one contract at a time, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I can afford nine more. But why do I play it that way? That's the question, right? Why do you... Do you see how bright my freaking car is? That's because the lights behind me are ridiculous. Um, so what the heck was I saying? So I'm not, you know, I'm not an options guru. I'm not a chart guy. I'm not any of those things. What I am is an income investor. So that's it. I keep things simple so I don't have to think too much. All right? I don't want to, you know, get too emotional on my plays. I don't want to try to predict what's going to happen. I just basically, I play the game to my limits and my strategy and that's it. So let's talk about the 10 contract strategy. Now, it's pretty simple. Like right now, this week, for example, I have two puts that are pending on TSLL. I have a, a put I sold for $11 strike and a, and a put I sold for a $12 strike. And at the time, TSLL was in $14, $15 range. So, you know, I got a decent premium and it was over earnings. So I wanted to take advantage of some of that implied volatility over earnings. Because keep in mind, any time you trade options over earnings, the implied volatility of, you know, during that time frame is going to be much higher. Why? Because earnings can produce anything. Like the stock could fly high after earnings. The stock can tank beyond belief after earnings. You don't know. Um, so me personally, I always want to take advantage, you know, at least a small portion get a few contracts out across earnings. Although I wasn't happy because I had to sell puts. I wasn't happy selling puts over earnings because the stock was near a high, but I still did it. 
So I still sold an $11 strike and a $12 strike over earnings on TSLL. So what's gonna happen now? Well, if you look at TSLL today, it looks like it's tanking. Like it looks like it's definitely gonna be below 12 by, uh, by Friday. Again, this, I don't know what's gonna happen. It's only Wednesday and it's, the market's not even open yet. But it looks like maybe it'll go to 10. Maybe it'll go to 10 bucks. So let's just say it goes to 10 bucks by Friday. What's gonna happen to me? I will get assigned, because I don't typically roll my new strategy. I don't roll, I don't worry about rolling. I just let it ride. So I, I, I do close out early, which we can talk about, but um, I typically, you know, for the most part, I'm not rolling. So I'm just gonna let my contracts ride out. If they get assigned, they get assigned. So guess what, okay, Friday comes, TSLL is at 10 bucks, I have to buy the hell 100 shares at $11 and then 100 shares at $12 so I pay you know I overpay for TSLL because it's at $10 anyone at the market price can get it for 10 bucks but me since I sold puts I have to buy 100 at 11 and 100 at 12 what does that mean it means I own 200 shares with a cost basis of 1150 so how am I gonna sell calls at 1150 when the stock price is 10. Well, I can, you can, you could sell calls at any price, as long as there's a buyer. Um, but the problem is, you may not get a nice premium at that price. So, you know, Friday happens, market closes, it's at 10 bucks, I have 200 shares, 11.50. Next week comes up, TSLL, let's just say it goes down again, it goes down to nine bucks. So, this, leads into why I want enough to have 10 contracts. So guess what? I have enough money to do eight more contracts. So if it drops to nine, you guess guess what I'm gonna do? I'll sell a put at nine bucks, I'll sell a put at eight bucks, I'll sell a put wherever I think is right, I'm gonna sell a put at a lower strike price than my current cost basis. So to me, from here on out, selling a put at a strike price below my cost basis is a win. And why is that? It, because if I get assigned, it'll lower my cost basis. So, but typically, I'm gonna sell puts either at the strike price, as long as it's below my cost basis, or below the strike price. And then, again, if, if I get assigned, let's just say at nine bucks or whatever, um, then I own another 100 shares, right? If it's down to $8 by that, that, that following Friday or whatever expiration date, then I have 300 shares and obviously a lower cost basis. And then I'm gonna repeat this process until TSLL eventually recovers and, and has to recover to my cost basis. Once it recovers to my cost basis, then guess what? I'm gonna sell calls on the 300 shares that I now own. But if it doesn't ever recover, I'm gonna continue to sell puts until it does. And the hope is that those 10 contracts, that's enough time and money to, you know, to utilize until the recovery happens. Obviously, it could, it could happen. Well, it did happen last time. I got down to, I got assigned on eight contracts. I had 800 shares of TSLL but you know what happened after that TSLL went up and I had a blast I was selling calls left and right um, I was going at the money above the money in the money and I had a blast and you know what happened from there all 800 got assigned but of course TSLL flew up high even higher so I could have made more money had I waited but I didn't because I wanted to collect premium at the time and there's no hard feelings about that about missing out on capital. I'm not worried about capital. I'm worried about premium income at that point in time because I'm always being active, I'm always making premium. So the fact that TSLL is going down this week, Tesla's going down this week, which means TSLL is going down this week, is a blessing for me because I've been waiting to sell puts on this stock again at a reasonable price, and I consider 10 bucks, 11 bucks, a good price. So I'm very, very happy 
Uh, like today, for example, like I said, I have pending puts that expire this Friday, 11 and 12. I will gladly sell another put at $10. I will gladly sell another put at $9. I'll choose an expiration date probably for either next Friday. I could choose this Friday. We still have three days. The premium may not be awesome. Um, it all depends. That's the other thing. You need to calculate how much premium you're going to get paid. And is it worth it to shell out that kind of money for that premium? So the return on investment, that's huge, right? I have a spreadsheet where I just run the numbers. I plug in certain numbers. It does the calculation for me. Um, and typically my return on investment, when I, you know, when I calculate it, I, I try to do it on an annualized basis. So I calculate, all right, how much am I earning for this amount of money? How many days did it take? Then I take, okay, what's the daily return on investment rate? And then I multiply that by 365 to annualize it. And that's basically, I just consider the annualized rate, okay? And as long as that's above 40%, which again, 40% is my sweet spot, I'm happy. Um, but it is very easy to get it above 40% with an applied volatility ETF over 100%, you know, you know the, that IV rate is insane. So it's very easy to make money. But also, have, you, have, you have to keep in mind, this stock moves, man. This stock moves. I It could go down to freaking, when I was doing options on this before, it went down to 550. I had 800 shares at like $7.80 cost basis. It went down to 550. And I was shitting bricks a little. I ain't gonna lie. I was like, damn. Like this 10 contract rule may not be enough. I may need 20 contracts. Um, and obviously the worst case scenario is Tesla goes bankrupt and then obviously I'm, I'm, I'm completely in the shitter. So, but that's the risk with options. And that's the risk with investing. But the point is, again, the point of this video, I know I kind of went on a crazy rant there about my process, but... I think everyone should learn options and no, don't overcomplicate it. Learn the basics, the buy call. What's a buy call? What's a buy put? What's a sell call? What's a sell put? Do I want to be the buyer or do I want to be the seller? You know, decide that. Do you want to be both? Sure, you could be both, but maybe it's a little too much in the beginning. Maybe just pick a side and learn it and play with it. If you're an income investor, you're more than likely going to be better on the sell side, right? You're going to sell puts. You're going to sell calls. If you already own 100 shares of a stock, then you can right away sell calls, right? You sell, it's called selling covered calls. Now, a lot of people are scared to do that, though, because they don't want their shares to get assigned. But again, then don't do it, right? If you don't want your shares assigned, don't do it because they're, oh, of course, there's always that risk. But just imagine owning all these shares and someone will pay you to sell your shares. You know, that's, it's a freaking amazing, it's awesome. Like options is awesome. So if you could find the time and money and you know, just to, to be able to utilize options, you will be so grateful because it's just, I mean, it's an unbelievable tool that so many people just don't get, they don't bother with. But they should. Even I don't. I invest in Yield Max too, and yeah, I, for the most part, most of my money is invested with them. They're trading the options for me. But at the same time, I'm I'm working full time. I got kids. You know, I don't have the type of time to do options more frequently. That's why, you know, I dabble. I'm dabbling. I call it dabbling, because um, you know, if anything, that most I do a contract a day. You know, sometimes a contract a week. It all depends. Like if, if there's a move, then I'll do it. If not, then again, most of my money's there. You know, Yield Max is doing it, or Defiance is doing it, or you know, Rec Shares is doing it. So, but yeah, again, most of my money I pay the experts to do it because they are the experts. I am not the export ex expert. However, I do enjoy trading options and. I find it valuable for me to do some myself because I believe I could, you know, I have a strategy that works for me and gives me a reasonable return on investment on the money that I'm putting up. So 
why not do it? Why not utilize it? So that's why I'm doing the 10 contract strategy. Now the latest update and the be most beautiful thing I've learned is margin. <clears throat> so I just signed up for margin. I know margin is a bad word for most people. So I always had <clears throat> like this 10, this 10 contract rule. We said $10,000, right? <clears throat> so I would need $10,000 liquid or at least $10,000 available some, somewhere in the account in order to do 10 contracts. <coughs> but with margin, <coughs> get a drink of water. <coughs> but with margin, let's just say I had $10,000 of margin equity. <coughs> I can now, if I have margin, I could use the 10,000 in cash that I had aside. I could buy that, put it to work by yield max. And I could use that 10,000 margin and I could sell puts on it. In that first contract, I'll sell a $10 put, $1,000, right? It's $1,000 for that collateral. That will be held in a pending status. It'll be held against the margin. But just because it's held against the margin doesn't mean I have to pay interest on that. That's what I'm finding out and learning. So that's freaking amazing. Of course, if I get assigned that $1,000, then it goes to the buyer. Okay, then I gotta pay interest on the thousand, but that's okay because I'm gonna sell calls again on that, and I'm gonna earn, you know, an annualized interest rate much higher than the margin interest rate that the broker is charging me. So I am making a profit on that thousand dollars when all said and done. But the beauty of it is, if I sell puts and I keep not getting assigned, that's just essentially borrowing money. You know, I guess I'll say free money that I'm borrowing with no interest. It's just on hold in case I need it. Before it was my cash on hold. And cash, you know, my cash, I want to earn money on that money, you know? But now it is. All of that cash I had, that's put to work. I spent all that shit. That, that's gone. So now anything I sell puts on, you're damn right, it's going to be through margin. So, again, I am brand new to margin, so take anything I say about margin with a grain of salt. I am not new to options, but I am at a lower level than most of your favorite option traders, but I speak only my language. This is my level, I stay there, okay? I'm not going up, I'm not going down. This is my level, this is my comfort level, and that's what I do, okay? But I feel like, you know, Sometimes newer people or people who want to learn options, they want to hear the very basics anyway. They don't need to hear, you know, about your butterflies, your credit spreads, this, that. You know, you start spitting out words like that, I'm running away. Like, if I know nothing about options and you're talking about butterfly or something, I'm like, what the f Like, get, get out of here. I ain't learning that. Just keep it simple, man. Four things. Buy, call, buy, put, sell, call, sell, put. Learn those four things, then you're good. You're good. Then, obviously, once you learn what the hell those four things are, then you decide, what am I gonna do? If I'm gonna use options, how am I gonna use it, right? Or am I gonna use it, number one? If you are going to use it, what strategy works best for you? So that's what you need to decide. And then, obviously, play it safe. I know so many people say, Use paper money, right? You go on the, a lot of brokerages allow you to use like paper money, which, you know, it, it's not a bad idea, but I'm different. I'm not like most people. I have to use money. I have to use my own money or else it's not, I'm not going to learn. If I'm trading paper money, I don't give a damn what happens. Yeah, let me sell a put. I'm not even going to look at it anymore. But if I sell a put with real money, you're damn right. I'm going to be looking at, at that like a hawk. So, paper money, my ass. I never use freaking paper money. I use my money right away. And guess what? I made mistakes, I lost money, but I learned from those mistakes. I learned from mistakes because I used actual money. I'm not saying that's best for you, but I'm just saying that's how I learned. Um, anyway, I'm almost at work, but I hope this options commute podcast, whatever you wanna call it, I hope it helped you guys out because I know I talk about options on my weekly videos, but maybe it's not enough. So maybe this was a good, you know, video to help explain it. And if it was, let me know. And, 
you know, and then maybe I'll post this video. I'll attach it to my weekly options update video. Uh, but let me know how it went. Let me know if you guys learned anything. Like if you're new to options, did this make sense? If you're experienced with options, do you think this may be, may be useful to people? Um, I don't know. Just give me some feedback if you don't mind. Um, as always, none of this is financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just a guy that normally records videos in his garage, sweating his ass off. But sometimes he records during his one hour commute to work because why the hell not, right? What else am I gonna do? I'm either gonna listen to another YouTuber or listen to the radio, but I might as well, you know, record myself and give some content out to you guys if you want it. I assume you want it, but we'll see. We'll see what the feedback is. Um, so yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to always hit the like button. It, it, it goes a long way. I know these commute podcast videos they don't do as well as some of my other videos, but you know, they do pretty decent, surprisingly. Because who the hell wants to look at some ugly dude driving a car? Um, but again, if, if the topic is relevant to people, then it is. Um, but hopefully, uh, like I said, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. I'm, I'm almost at work, I'm going to the gym at work first, and then I'm gonna, you know, then work, and then that's it. But uh, yeah, time to wake up, get pumped. It's leg day, baby, leg day. I have no energy, by the way. Ugh. Yeah, sometimes when you drive to work, especially if it's an hour, it's like, oh my God. By the time you get there, you're like, Bleh. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will talk to you later.